to staying the course. Join us as we navigate the uncompromised Word of God with Pastor Brett Peterson. I love your word. I love the way. Just wanted to remind you guys real quick. Um, just no matter how we failed God, you know, and, and we all do, no matter how we have failed him, no matter how bad, uh, he still loves us. And uh, he wants us to love him. So I was reminded of that uh, this week, this last week, um, when I was reading about Peter and Peter's failings. Uh, you know, John, in John chapter 21, Jesus has come back, he's been resurrected, and uh, he's coming back, he's walking around the earth, and he goes and he visits Peter, and Peter's out fishing, and, uh, you know, why, why is Peter fishing? I, I don't know my, my personal thoughts, or he's failed Jesus, he denied Jesus three times, and maybe he feels unworthy to, uh, to go out and, and uh, minister for Jesus, I, I don't know, but, you know, Jesus sits down with him, and uh, you would think Jesus would be like, hey, Peter, I told you so. I told you you were going to deny me. Why did you deny me, Peter? Something along those lines, right? But he doesn't. He asks him one simple question. He says, Peter, do you love me? And he repeats that three times. He says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, tells him twice that he does. And on the third time, Peter says, Lord, you know that I love you. And it just grieves Peter. It grieves Peter's heart. You know, I'm sure Peter's sitting there saying, you know, just a few weeks ago I, I denied Jesus three times. And now he's asking me three times if I love him. You know, that was one moment of Peter's life, a cowardly act. He was defeated by the enemy. But that's not like, that's, not, that's nothing that we don't go through. You know, Jesus is not asking Peter the question that he doesn't know the answer to. He's not asking Peter if he loves him because he's unsure. He knows Peter loves him. I think he's saying, hey, Peter, forget about the past. For forget what happened. I just want you to know how much you love me. I know how much you love me, but I want you to know how much you really love me. If the Lord's questioning you this morning, don't be concerned. If he's pulling you aside, if he's pushing you in a corner, if he's backing you up and he's asking you questions, don't worry about it. It's because he loves you. And he wants you to know how much you love him. You know, there was an old uh, pastor, teacher named Oswald Chambers back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And I read this quote this week, and it's fitting. He said, the, Lord questions, the Lord's questions always reveal true me to myself. Rarely, but probably once in each of our lives, he will back us into a corner where he will hurt us with piercing questions then we realize that we do love him more than words can ever say. So if he's backing you in a corner this morning, if he's asking you some piercing questions, don't be worried, it's okay. He could be preparing you for something great. Because that's not the end of the story with Peter. What happened just a short time later with Peter? It's in Acts chapter 2, I think. Yeah, it's in Acts chapter 2. Peter's preaching the word boldly. Peter's out there talking about Jesus. Just a short time ago, Peter denied Jesus. Now he's out there boldly proclaiming the name of Christ. And what happened? 3,000 people gave their lives to him. So no matter how, may, how you may have failed him, don't let Satan tell you that you're unworthy. Don't let him tell you that you're disqualified from ministry. We're all in ministry. We're all God's ministers. We're all we're all made to go out there and spread the good news. Don't even let the devil tell you that you're unqualified because you're not. Jesus denied Peter, sorry, Peter denied Jesus publicly three times. And look what a great man of God Peter was. If Jesus is knocking at the door of your heart this morning and asking if you love him, answer with a resounding yes. Let's go and have a conversation this morning. Let's tell Jesus how much we love him. He already knows, but as we see from the story of Peter, it's a good reminder for us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and we love you. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. God, we thank you for sending your Son down to the earth to take the punishment for everything that we could have done wrong. Lord, no matter, the, no matter what we have done, Lord, Jesus, we know that you have paid the price for all of our sins. 
And Lord, while there's nothing we can ever do to repay you, we know that all you want us to do is to love you. We pray that we would love you more each day. Lord, I just pray, God, that you would be with Pastor Brett and Cheryl today. I pray that you would be with Pastor Chris. Father, I thank you for Kevin, who you've raised up, who you've prepared to come and teach your word to us this morning. Father, I pray that you would be with him. I pray that the teaching that comes out of him would be through you and through you alone. I pray that you'd prepare our hearts for the awesome teaching that we're about to receive. God, I thank you for these tithes. I thank you for these offerings. Lord, I pray that they would be used for your will and for your will alone. And we just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, brother. Set their expectations high. Good. <laughs> yeah, Pastor Brett is out um, traveling in Alaska, so pray for his safety and, and for Cheryl's as well. Uh, he will be back uh, next week, but we will be continuing in Genesis this morning. Uh, so turn in your Bible to Genesis 44, verse 14. Now, this is a story of Joseph that we're continuing on, and uh, uh, the message we're going to hear today is loosely based upon my new book, which is How to Make All Your Dreams Come True, <laughs> the Joseph story. You can get it online for 39 bucks, or today it's uh, the entire front row gets a free copy. So. <laughs> Genesis 44, verse 14. Only one thing's true about what I just said. Today's uh, story is about prosperity. Um, and I think uh, Chris outlined it perfectly. It's also about forgiveness. Uh, let's recap first, though. Uh, what's happened so far in the story of Joseph? Uh, we have the ten brothers who go to Egypt for food because there's a famine. And we find out it's a worldwide famine. Um, Joseph recognizes them as he's come to power in Egypt, but they don't recognize him. Um, he accuses them of being spies sort of as a test um, since they don't recognize him. And he agrees to let all of them go back to prove that their story is true, that they have a father who is alive and another younger brother, but he keeps Simeon in jail until they do. Um, when he returns them with food, he secretly puts money in their sacks and they notice it when they get home and they think, what is he going to do to us when he finds out we've stolen from him? How can we go back? Well, back in Canaan, Israel, also called Jacob, agrees to let them return to Egypt with Benjamin after Judah puts up his own life as surety, saying, if I don't return with Benjamin, then be it on my own life. And uh, this is sort of in line with Judah's character and what he would become, his role in Christ's birth as he is uh, the tribe through which Christ would be born. So the brothers go to Egypt a second time, this time with Benjamin. They go back to repay Joseph, um, who they don't know is Joseph yet, with the money that they find in their sacks. They go to buy more food. Joseph sends them again away with the money and places his divination cup inside Benjamin's sack. Um, Joseph sends his house steward after them, knowing that it's in the cup, but they're on or in the sack, but they're unaware. And the brothers tear their clothes once they're caught red-handed, knowing what it would mean for them. And so they return to the city. I just want to say that throughout his life, Joseph always trusted God. We kind of tend to look at Joseph's life as faultless. And it wasn't faultless, as we've seen. Um, there are a few things that he could have done that uh, would have given him, uh, would have made him without blame. Um, but he always trusted in God, and for that, God was always with him. He had a rough life that could have gone south at any moment, really bad. Uh, being put in an Egyptian jail, uh, being accused of making an advance on Potiphar's wife. But the Lord was always with him. As a result, he prospered against the circumstances, even to the heights 
of becoming Pharaoh's chief minister, which was at that time the highest position of power in the world into which you didn't have to be born as Pharaoh was. But the story where we pick it up, the brothers, still not knowing that this man is Joseph, return to the city. Genesis 44, verse 14, it says, When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there, and they fell to the ground before him. Joseph said to them, What is this deed that you have done? Do you know that such a man as I can indeed practice divination? So Judah said, What can we say to my Lord? What can we speak? And how can we justify ourselves? God has found out the iniquity of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's slaves, both we and the one in whose possession the cup has been found. But he said, speaking of Joseph, far be it from me to do this, that is, to make them all slaves. He says, the man in whose possession the cup has been found, he shall be my slave. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. Look at verse 14. It says, when Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house. Now, who was the, the eldest born of Jacob? It was Reuben, right? And in that culture, the firstborn had all the privileges. And yet here it says Judah and his brothers. Because at that time, Judah had stepped up and taken the lead. Now, you've got to remember that uh, Genesis was passed down by oral tradition until it was written. And oral tradition already knows the ending. So when it's spoken in this tense, they know Judah's destiny before it's being written down. They knew his importance above his eldest brother. It puts Judah ahead of Reuben, not the other way around. Um, I have an older brother, and we both went to both of the same schools for elementary and high school, and uh, we don't look that different from each other. (laughs) But uh, when his friends would uh, see me or uh, the teachers that he had saw me, they go, you're Chris's bro- brother, aren't you? I go, no, but Chris is my brother. There's a difference. <laughs> there is a difference. So, especially in this case, it says Judah and his brothers. Judah is the key in this place, in the Bible. Can God overcome social rank? Yeah, he certainly can. He did that with Judah. Can he defy cultural wisdom? Of course. Judah's not here just because of what he would do, either. He's here because he's of what he's already done. Go back to Genesis 37, verse 26. This is the plot to kill Joseph. You may remember what Judah had done for his brother in this case. The brothers had gotten together and saw the favoritism that their father had on Joseph. And... Uh, I think 10 is enough to make a mob. (laughs) And they thought they wanted to kill him to get rid of this problem. But Judah uh, intervened. He said, what profit is it for us to kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. For he is our brother, our own flesh, and his brothers listened to him. Judah saved Joseph's life. Without that sort of reasoning, he he may not be where he is today. And likewise, the brothers probably would have been impoverished and, and died because the famine was going to come, regardless of whether Egypt was going to be prepared for it or not. Verse 15, back in our text, it says, Do you not know that such a man as I can indeed practice divination? In other words, he's saying, Did you think that I wouldn't figure it out, either naturally or supernaturally? Joseph saying, do you think I'm stupid, even though he was the one who set them up? This was able, to, by this he was able to sell his story to them, because at this point they have no idea that Joseph is setting them up and all these things. Maybe they thought Benjamin did steal the cup and condemned them all in the process. Verse 16 says, God has found out the iniquity of your servants. This is a sign that Judah may have still been feeling guilty about what happened to Joseph and never saw the consequences of it. Maybe he thought for all those years he got away with it scot-free. 
But at this point, he steps up and admits his guilt. In verse 17, Joseph says, Only Benjamin shall be my slave. Now, Joseph is in a good position here. He has them dead to rights. He's caught them red-handed. He can do with all of them whatever he wants. But here, he has a chance to legally keep his only full brother, the rest of the brothers were half-brothers, and send the rest of the way, having them think that, number one, Benjamin is alive, at least. He's a slave, not going to be sentenced to death. And number two, there's no way that they're going to get him back. So perhaps in uh, Joseph's ideal situation, he has Benjamin, the brothers are sent away, and he gets to live with his favorite brother. And there's no chance of them pursuing. But Joseph did not know the guarantee that Judah had made with his father. And in verse 18, (laughs) Judah has a dissertation where he explains it to him. Now, this passage is kind of confusing when it's in the third person. For example, Jesus says, Oh my Lord, may your servant please speak a word in my Lord's ears. We don't know who is whom, so I'm just going to um, put the proper nouns there, or the pronouns, so it's uh, easier to understand. Starting in verse 18, Judah approached Joseph and said, O oh my Lord, may I please speak a word in your ears, and do not be angry with me, for you are equal to Pharaoh. You asked your servants, saying, Have you a father or a brother? We said to you, We have an old father and a little child of his old age. Now his brother is dead, so he is left alone of his mother, and his father loves him. Then you said to us, Bring him down to me that I may set my eyes on him. But we said to you, The lad cannot leave his father, for if he should leave his father, his father would die. You, Joseph, said to us, However, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you will not see my face again. Thus it came about when we went up to our father, we told him your words. The father said, Go back, buy us a little food. But we said, We cannot go down. If our youngest brother is with us, then we will go down. But if we cannot see the man's face, unless our youngest brother is with us. Our father said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons. And the one went out for me, and I said, Surely he is torn in pieces, and I have not seen him since. If you take this one also from me, and harm befalls him, you will bring my gray hair down to Sheol in sorrow. Now therefore, when I come to you, my father, I'm sorry, when I come to my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life, when he sees that the lad is not with us, he will die. Thus we will bring the gray hair of our father down to Sheol in sorrow. For I became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then let me bear the blame before my father forever. Now, therefore, please let me remain instead of the lad a slave to you, and let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me, for fear that I see the evil that would overtake my father? So in essence, what Judah does is he recounts everything that's occurred, and his story doesn't change. In uh, criminal law, you can often tell um, someone who's lying in their confession based on how much their confession changes. Um, And in life as well, someone changes their story each time they tell it to you. What's the probability that the story they're telling you is true? There's almost no way to tell. But Judah recounts everything that's occurred, and Judah knows it's true. And he reveals what has occurred since they've been gone. Now, in Joseph's perfect world, he'd be able to keep Benjamin. But since Judah had stepped up and done this manly thing, almost as like a Christ figure, putting his life in place of another, and made this promise to his father, there's no way that Joseph can have his perfect world. Because he would be with Judah. Um, in verse 45.3 um, I'm sorry, we'll get to that later. All 
I lost my place. Don't you hate it when that happens? Okay, verse 45, 1. Then Joseph could not control himself before all who stood by him. And he cried, have everyone go out from me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. Now, once Joseph realizes that Judah had stepped up and made the sacrifice, he's ready to reveal himself to all his brothers. Um, Pastor Brett made note in a previous verse, chapter 42, verse 35, he pointed out the word dismayed. And he said it wasn't just dismayed, but it was afraid, sort of in awe or in dread. We see a similar word here in the English in verse 3. It says, the brothers were dismayed at his presence once they had found out. It's a different word in the Hebrew. Um, It's similar, but it means more in the effect of they were alarmed or nervous, really to make hasty. Now, if all these things you had said to this man, who you thought was just a chief minister, revealed himself to be the son that you thought was dead, you had sold into slavery and had faked his death, to your father, wouldn't your heart beat a little quicker? I think, I think it would. At that time, I be- their heart was beating quickly. Joseph had revealed himself. How do you suppose Joseph was able to forgive his brothers? You ever hear the phrase, I forgive you, but I do not trust you? You ever use it yourself? In essence, what you're saying is, I trusted you, and you let me down. Perhaps that's why you were let down in the first place. You put your trust in something apart from God. What are some other flimsy things we put our trust in? Our intellect. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. Our ability. Psalm 18, 2 says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress, and my deliverer my God, my strength, and whom I trust, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. We put our trust in our money. Proverbs 28.25 says, He who trusts in the Lord will be prospered. Do you know why we put in God we trust on our money? Because we don't trust in money. And that's the point. That's what our forefathers meant. Do we put our trust in idols, whether physical or or figurative? Psalm 31.6 says, I hate those who regard vain idols, but I trust in the Lord. Do we put our trust in our career, in our job? Psalm 37.5 says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will do it. Do we put our trust in other people? Psalm 118.8 says, it is better to trust the Lord and put confidence in man. How can we be offended by something we chose to put our trust in? And how do we forgive someone who isn't trustworthy? Really, the only thing I can really trust another person to do is make a mistake every once in a while, let alone myself. Luke 17, 3, Jesus said, Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. Now, to rebuke isn't to condemn a person, but to condemn their actions. Matthew 18, 21 says, Then Peter came, to, came and said to him, speaking of Jesus, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. And when he had begun to settle them, 
one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and his children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. By the way, 10,000 talents in today's money is like $50 billion. It's an, it's an insurmountable amount. That, uh, verse 27. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave the debt. That slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owned him a hundred denarii, which is a smaller amount, much smaller. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling, and he went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what he was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord, moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed to him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from his heart. Pretty strong message there. This is something that Joseph knew very well. The point is, I forgive you because God has forgiven me, not because I trusted you. So we should only forgive when our brother or sister asks for it. Luke 17.3 says, if he comes to you and asks for repentance, you must forgive him. Is that what Jesus would do? In Luke 23.34, Jesus was on the cross, dying, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. He said this about men who were literally killing him and enjoying it. He who did no wrong. So let me ask, what could someone do to you that you would not forgive them? And what could you do that God would not forgive you? The answer to both questions should be the same. It's nothing. I forgive you because I trust in God. Joseph trusted in God. And because of this, I suspect he forgave his brothers to God in his heart before his sandals clapped against the bottom of that pit that they threw him in so many years ago. Continuing on in chapter 45, verse 4. It says, Then Joseph said to his brothers, Please come closer to me. And they came closer. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves, because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord to all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not delay. You shall live in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me you and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will also provide for you. For there are still five years of famine to come, and you and your household and all that you have, you have would be impoverished. Behold, your eyes see and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth which is speaking to you. Now you must tell my father of all my splendor in Egypt and all that you have seen, and you must hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept on his neck. He kissed all his brothers and wept on them, and afterward his brothers talked with him. Now up until verse 2 of this chapter, he may have been speaking through an interpreter. But at this point he converts to his native tongue and says, Look, it's me who's talking to you. Your brother Joseph, tell your father, You saw me speak and I am alive. 
He says, come closer to me. I'm the brother you sold into Egypt. Don't be grieved, because what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Now where it says uh, he became a father to Pharaoh, that simply means a chief minister. Something along those lines. Prime minister, perhaps. It's funny. Grudges and guilt will bring separation and more pain, but forgiveness brings restoration. Joseph understood this, and he valued his relationship with his brothers more than he valued hanging on to a past hurt. At the death of Israel, in Genesis 50, verse 19, it says, The brothers begged Joseph for forgiveness, suspecting um, su- suspecting that he was only being kind to them on Israel's behalf. And this is uh, from the text. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Now God has entrusted us with certain things. And these are the things we went over. A job, a wife or a husband, kids, your wealth, your health, your intellect, your freedom, if you live in America, your life. He's entrusted us with all these things for the purpose of carrying out his will. And he has not given us these things to lord them over people or to leverage them at the perfect opportunity, which Joseph easily could have done. He says, am I in God's place? Is it my place to accuse another's sins? Is it my place to hold a grudge? Or is it my place to exact judgment? Or are those God's place? The conclusion is this. Trust in God. And after that, it's easy to forgive. Then the Lord will be with you and cause all you do to prosper. I don't think it's an accident that uh, God gave a word to Chris this morning to change the service up a bit or the word he spoke in his homily about forgiveness. I think it ties in perfectly. Thank you for hearing from the Lord. I don't think it's an accident that all of us live here in America and have been given certain things. Are we using those for God's will? Has he entrusted us by allowing us to be born here in a certain family and to look a certain way? For our own purpose or for his? How can we possibly hold a grudge against someone who's taken away one of these things? Is that not God's place? Comforts me, strengthens and restores my soul, satisfies my need. Thank you for listening to Staying the Course with Pastor Brett Peterson. If you would like a copy of this message or would like to submit a prayer request or comment, contact us at 949-888-5777 or email us at info at ccbcu.edu. God bless you as you seek and serve Him. Remember, stay the course, and we'll see you next week. I love your word, I love the way it comforts me, strengthens and restores my soul, satisfies my need. I love